Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, whenever in the world you're watching this. And um, Paula, if you got on, just put a comment in the comments section, which, um, yeah, I now have the right button clicked. And um, thank you so much for joining us. It is June 22nd, 2021. Can't even believe the year is half over. And I'm so excited to have my guest today, Sue Bolton, who we met during coaching school. And yes, we are certified coaches. And yes, you can get a coach that isn't certified. And I'm sure there's lots out there that are fine. But those of us that went to IPEC are better. Pick us. And um, that's my niche. That's who I want to go after as to help mostly is first-time leaders because... I believe it's a forgotten classification. And when I was in there, I moved several times during my career. I've worked most of my time in government. And so I've gone from city to city and I've taken different um, promotions. And it's like, here's your desk. I went to one city, here's your desk. All that stuff under, all the boxes under the desk are yours and um, have a good day. Like nobody says, like helps you. And so that's why I so love helping first-time leaders. And it's just coincidental that I saw on Sue's blog, 10 tips for new managers. And so we're going to eventually get to that, maybe. And we might not get through all 10 of them because we're going to chat, we're going to laugh, we're going to have lots of fun. And I've been teasing Sue that she's a saint. She's a saint, Sue, because she has... Um, decorations on the back of her. Yeah, it looks amazing. It just looks amazing. <laughs> so Sue, do you want to introduce us, um, introduce yourself to us and we'll take it from there. Sure. Hi everyone. My name is Sue Bolton and I am the CEO and founder of Transformative Visions. My partner, Paula Conkey, couldn't make it today. Uh, together, we established this company back in 2017, actually. We've been mm. away at it. Um, and I also work a full-time job. I am currently employed at STARS. Uh, and prior to that, I was employed at Netflix and before that, McGraw-Hill for a very long time. And I've been a leader for, I don't know, since the dawn of time, Joan, that's what it felt like. And I have to agree that with some companies, there is not much support and training for those new managers that shift from those individual contributors going into that management of people kind of role. And it's a shame because that first role, having that sort of training and support could really make a difference. And then on the flip side, I've also worked for companies who put programs in place, uh, Netflix being an example of them. They were really strong with supporting their leaders, supporting first-time leaders. I helped contribute to building a management course uh, there with a HR person in another department. And so there was a lot of activity for supporting, supporting those leaders. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm committed to making a difference for managers at any stage of their path in leadership mm -hmm. because I, I do believe there are some skills that leaders have and should learn about, but there are also qualities and traits uh, that we should dig into and see if we can acquire. Absolutely. You know, I call it the green room and I don't know if maybe that's just because I'm old and that's what they used to call it on like Johnny Carson or something. But um, before we went live, we talked about a couple things and I really wanted you to expand a little bit on, um, let me see if I go on my LinkedIn, if I can see if uh, Paula is on here. Okay, Paula, just if you're there, oh, she's at work, so she can't really comment. She can just watch. Okay, back to you and me present. Um, you talked about, which I totally believe, that you can't really separate. When you say when you coach leaders, you coach more like who they are, their beingness, their beingness of being a leader. Like you can't really separate like this is what I tell my people. This is what I believe. Like I have core values that I follow. So I, I really believe in values-based leadership. So I'm the same person now with you live on LinkedIn as I am 
at the grocery store <laughs> or I am when I just go down and get my mail. And so I don't know how you can separate it. So people that compartmentalize their lives, like I'm at work, I'm at home, I'm that, then that, then that, you know, it sounds like you pull them out of the box. Now I don't want to put any words in your mouth, but you take the compartments maybe and expand them or join them or tell me more about, I wrote what I wrote was interrelated and being. Yeah. So that comment was relating to, uh, I guess my perspective on what leadership is like, I don't think leadership is a role or a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. It's a way of being, it's who you're being. And so that mm -hmm. is dependent on qualities and traits that you exhibit. And what I see with strong leaders are leaders who, who can inspire people, leaders who can identify a vision and then get everybody on board that vision. And so there are t qualities that go with that inspiration, drive, motivation, getting people connected, getting them all aligned, right? So how do you get people to start to exhibit those qualities rather than just learning traits? And I always say that mm -hmm. qualities like that, they're contextual, right? Like, if you're driven, when are you driven? In what scenarios, right? So a coach can help you see mm -hmm. when you're driven and in what context. Mm -hmm. Then they can help you work with work on that to pull that drive over into, say, work or another context. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But it's identifying those those that, those qualities, seeing in what context you're you're being those. And then exactly. working to exhibit them at mm -hmm. work, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are very clear qualities with stunning leaders versus just managers, right? And then on top of that, when you layer skills, because there are certain skills that as a new manager or a leader, you should learn. It's not about doing what you used to do as an individual contributor but working harder and longer and faster because if you do that you're actually going to tread on your employees and get in the way of their work right so you've got to focus on other stuff so what is that other stuff right and i would say it's very much about learning about the soft skills of management, yeah. learning how to manage your team. You can't manage everyone on your team in the same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's identifying those high performers and low performers. It's identifying those that are highly motivated or low skilled, right? And then once you've identified those on your team, you manage them in different ways as a result of that, right? So the high performers, you just delegate, they'll run off. The low performers, you want to supervise, you want to keep them really, really close. The newbies or the people who don't have the skills, teach them, right? And then those who have the skills but no motivation, those right there we need to coach, right? Because coaching will help to bring that motivation out. So that's that's learning around the soft skills. And there's others too, right? Like as a leader, I do believe that it all starts with a vision. So what's that vision that you have and your team has? Because that's going to set the direction and align the team. It's going to get them to work on the right projects to deliver on that vision rather than doing random projects. So start with a vision build the team. So how do you build that team, right? Like you've got to build a team that's high performing, identify who they are, what your management tactics are, and then start working on some of the things that support that performance, establish trust, right? Have them start to really dig into the difficult subjects and talk about those difficult subjects. Identify your strategies, your goals, assign people to those projects or those goals, figure out what the measurements are around that. It's all, you know, aim smart goals, right? Because that's the deliverables and then get them to deliver those results. So there's a lot of coaching and feedback as a manager that you've got to learn to do to support your team. 
And that's where having a mentor or a coach, especially as a first-time leader, is really, really important. They can help Mm -hmm. with these. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good segue because there were so many things I wanted to comment on and what you said. You're such a fantastic speaker. You talked about vision, and you do have vision in your company name, Transformative Visions. And then um, on the 10 things that 10 tips for new managers, number one is get a mentor. Yeah. And you had mentioned that. Now, um, do you think there's a difference or even anything to talk about the difference between a mentor and a coach? Or are you saying they're the same in this? Uh, It depends, again, on the context. Um, Certainly if it was a new manager at work, Uh, It could be a coach outside of work Mm -hmm. or it could be a mentor inside of work, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, I'd say mentorship and coaching are different. Mm -hmm. Mentorship is very driven by the person being mentored and the mentor is sharing their experiences Mm -hmm with the mentee, whereas a coach is helping shine the light on blind spots that the coachee might have, that their blocks that might get in the way of their success. It's driven again by the coachee, but it's a different relationship. Mm -hmm. It depends on what you're you're trying to get out of it. Um, Either will work, it just depends on your objectives. Right. I say like a when I explain to my new clients um, that a mentor is someone who has been where you want to go. Yeah. So they're going to say, I go, I joined this professional organization. I get this magazine from that professional organization. I go to this, I do this, I do this. And um, a coach is you're here and you want to get here. They're very, very similar Now, I'm looking on your website, number one, get a mentor, and you talked about meet meet for coffee, send a thank you note, or, you know, pick up the tab as a a genuine thank you gesture. My clients have a hard time, and for first-time managers and leaders, Mm -hmm. asking people. And so I'll tell them, you know, in my example of life, because I am very disorganized and usually overwhelmed with doing five projects at at the same time. I want to help you, but your email or text is now down on page three or four. And so it's not that I, you're bothering me because my clients will go, but I'm bothering them. And I'm like, I'm telling you, that's what people, I don't want to speak for you, Sue, but people in my, you know, we finally, what would it have been like if we had a mentor? Yeah. Back in the day in our twenties or thirties, what would it have been like if some, we would be in, I feel like I would be in a completely different person a position because I just kind of put my head down and barreled through life. Yeah. So um, what would you say to my clients who say, Oh, everyone's busy. I know they're really busy. <laughs> a couple of things. One is, I think we fear no for various reasons. Mm -hmm. Really, it's just a no. It might be a no for right now. Mm -hmm. It might be a no because they need a babysitter to organise. It's not a rejection of ourselves, right? So we we often collapse no with a rejection of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So we, we really create a lot of, I guess, stigma to the the word no. It's a no. Try with someone else, right? Like, don't stop. Be persistent. Mm -hmm. And here's the other other side of it is any new manager or senior leader should be really clear on what their values are, right? If you have identified what your values are, personal values, you can then start to live a life in alignment with those values, right, Mm -hmm. which means that you as a potential mentor or you as a mentee looking for a mentor will take actions 
and be persistent in line with those values. Exactly. Right? So if my value is being the best, one of the things is having integrity, right? So what does that mean is that I'm giving honour to my word, right? So I'm going to do things that are integrity, that are in integrity with my goal and my vision, right? So I won't stop. I'll be persistent at stuff because it's living in integrity. So I'll take the actions that line up. So don't stop. Be persistent. If they say no, it doesn't mean anything about you. <laughs> it just means that they're busy. Find someone else, mm -hmm. right? And then identify the values so that you can take actions in line with those values. Yeah, and I guess I'm just thinking, as you're saying that, I'm thinking it's not a life, life, lifetime commitment. No. It's you know, not. Um, someone told me years ago in regards to something else, but similar to men mentorship, like when Lewis and Clark crossed the country, you know, they had many guides. Yeah. They had the one guy, which I cannot remember her name right now, but like, or even if any explorer and the party gets to the river and the, and the mentor, the guide says, Oh, I've never been across the river, but she has. So then that, woman takes you across the river and you come to the mountain and she says, Oh, I've never been to uh, over the mountain, but he has. So there's going to be people in your life yeah. that change, but that make, you know, profound effects on you. Yeah. And I also would say as a leader, being connected to your heart is really critical and often in most companies, especially tech companies or, you know, finance, those, those very dry domains, you won't see a lot of leadership be connected to their heart. Uh, it's that very old 1980s model of control and hierarchy uh, type of leadership, right? And there's a shift coming. There is a shift with leader leadership starting to be connected to the heart, to authentic leadership, right? And that's certainly the mission uh, with our company is to get people connected back to the heart because it's important. Because if you're connected to the heart, synchronicity starts to come in. Right, and your leader. Speaking my language. You're speaking it, my language right, right now. It starts to flow perfectly, and mm -hmm. when you're on that right path in the right job, it's effortless. It just all starts to come together, right? Because you're so connected and listening to that intuition, even with simple things like hiring people. Intuitively, you know, you know if this person's going to be a right fit for that team. You know if they're going to upskill the team, right? But you do all your, your critical analysis and critical thinking. You check for bias. You check for skill fit. You look for the qualities that are important to the team, but you also do an intuitive check. So there's something to be said about being connected back to the heart that supplements the hard left brain kind of skills with leadership. I think it's really important. I love how on your website you talk about, I hope I get this right, that you are the right brain creative person and Paula is. Paula is. Okay. I, I thought it was interesting that you you called it out, that one is right and one yeah. is right. It's the perfect compliment. We we complement Absolutely. each other so Absolutely. well. Yeah, I'm all left brain, a bit of a machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she brings the humanity back into my machine. We're such a perfect complement. It's nice, great. nice. And I think that leads us perfectly to number two of your ten tips, which is set the tone. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes what I see with new leaders is there's suddenly this, I don't know, it's it's this burst of acknowledgement in terms of, oh, wow, I have power, I have authority, right? Um, and so they then go into one of two, two areas, I guess. One is either they try really hard to be liked by the team and they create mm -hmm. these, they, they manage through friendship. Mm -hmm. 
and being nice mm-hmm. or they go into a power trip. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And so that can also work really badly because either way they're not listening and interacting mm-hmm. with their team mm-hmm. or being the leader that the team needs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so by setting the tone, what I mean is it's all about being authentic, having fun with your team, yes, but listening to them without pulling the control authority card. Um, And I think that's really, really important, especially for new leaders, is listen to your team's pain points, listen to your team's issues, listen to what they need, because they're the person who knows the most about their job, not you. Exactly. And the higher you go up, the less I need to know specifically what everyone's doing. Okay, so Paula was able to take a quick break and join us so I can hit this magic button and it comes across here. Amazing. (laughs) So um, a quick pop pop in. She's saying, I love that. And she also um, practices awareness. Yeah. It's It's within that space that we can see, I love the quotation marks, those who are energetically open to helping us or conversely may be open to uh, um, us supporting them. Yeah. Not easy to do because especially when you're in a company that you're flying by the seat of your pants, right? It's mm-hmm. react, solve, react, solve, react, solve. It's, it's inside of that we often as leaders go unconscious or we get hijacked by our emotions, right, um, known as the amygdala hijack, right? Mm-hmm. So when something doesn't go the way we want it to go, someone else wants to do something, often leaders get upset by that and their emotions take over. And, you know, it's my view that leaders need to be professional. They can't lose their cool and either have tantrums, uh, ice people out or shout at people. It's just not appropriate for a leader to Mm -hmm. do that because a leader is also someone who uh, people mimic, right? And so what a leader does others do and suddenly you're creating that in your culture so it's really important to have your emotions in check uh and then like paula says be aware uh but hard sometimes some days no (laughs) but yeah but you know and the same with i tell my my clients and the same with when i'm when i was raising my children or if someone's raising the children i'm having a bad day today can we talk about this tomorrow? It would be so helpful for me if we could talk about this tomorrow. Now, when I say that to my kids or my employees, I'm a human being. Yeah. You know, so it gives us, um, oh, it's it's less of them and us. Yeah. I really love, love, love this book. And I was, I was just thinking about him, Gary, um, I mean, Gary Ridge is the CEO of um, WD40, and he introduced me to this book when I was taking a class with him in my master's program. But this is actually by Marshall Goldsmith. What got you here won't get you there. And in here, very briefly, he says, the higher you go up, the more what you say comes across as a demand or a command. Yeah. So, but let's go on to, you have number three. If it's okay with you, we'll go on to number three, which is plan regular consistent meetings. Amen. I just want to say hallelujah or something to that. Yeah, yeah. Like you've got to connect with people and there's different types of meetings with different objectives. So if I go through the meetings I have, I have a manager's leads meeting. So all the managers that report to me and their leads under them, come to this leads meeting. It's once every two weeks. And we talk about vision, strategy, personnel issues, things like that, right? Very team focused. Um, I then have one-on-ones every week with my direct reports, every two weeks with those indirect reports, and then once a month with the indirects direct reports so it's a third fourth level right Mm -hmm. um just so that i'm connected with the team and then every two weeks i have a group meeting and we talk about 
projects, initiatives, uh, thrash with partners, things like that. And so there's different layers to connect with. And then there's stakeholder meetings, right? I cannot say, speak to how important regular stakeholder meetings are. So put together a stakeholder map, identify who the important ones are and who the influencers are, right? And then figure out what the cadence is for you to stay connected with those. Are they directly involved in some way with your work? Great, once a week, once every two weeks. Is it someone I just need to check in with? Great, meet with them every six months, just stay connected because it's through those stakeholder meetings that you're actually going to listen to or hear opportunities for innovation, partnership, new projects, all sorts of stuff. Whereas when you focus just on your team, you're in an isolated bubble. And so you start to then work on things that potentially could impact them. And then you set the tone in a very negative way because now they're impacted and they're upset, right? Mm -hmm. So stay connected to your stakeholders. Like my calendar is like back-to-back -back stakeholder meetings, team meetings. It just is, it's constant. They're everywhere, right? So critical, especially as a senior leader or an intro leader. Okay, so as a first-time leader, mm -hmm. I'll say I'll say to my clients, um, well, how often do you meet with the next level? Your boss, I guess people don't say supervisor these days, whatever, your director, your vice president, whatever you're you're leading up to, and they'll say, Well, we don't. I so, then I, so then I say, Okay, yeah. well, you need to. So now here I am, a new leader, and I'm gonna ask my manager who's very busy or the vice president, whatever, again, it could be a much higher, you might answer to someone much higher than you. And it's almost like I'm a little kid saying, excuse me, you know, I know you're busy, but can I have some time? So what would you, what would you, what advice would you give to people that ha have, are trying to do it opposite? Yeah. So one, put that, calendar invite in the calendar yourself like with that manager be fearless right <laughs> um, because not doing that is taking an action inside of fear right the context that we're holding is fear right whereas when you're holding courage as a context you're going to take an action in line with courage so be courageous right and then say to them look I think it's important that we connect, be it once a week, once a month, so that we stay aligned. I want to stay aligned. I want to make sure that my team is in line with your strategies and we're delivering on those. Mm -hmm. um, so explicitly call that out. Um, don't let fear stop you and notice that it's in your head, it's language. It's not in in the physical world out there. You're reacting. Oh, I love you're that. Killing yourself in your head. Definitely. Right. So that might not be the reality for anyone else around you, but you're reacting to your reality that's in your head. So no, you can go beyond that. Right, and that reminds me of. And there's so many books out there on this um, on leading up. Yes. So, so your manager may have never had a manager that met with them. Yes. So they're um, they're just not used to doing it. It's not in their wheelhouse. And sometimes I'll say, um, it would help me to be successful. Um, I want to be very successful in this. I mean, I will tell them to say, I want to be very successful. You know, I just want to touch base, you know, things like that. And then the next one, if we can move on to number four, which I absolutely love all of these so far, set clear expectations. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> oh, come on. People don't even, you know, we speak in this very vague, you know, um, that's a priority, so I'm going to need it soon. Yeah. What does that even mean? It's very vague. And so set clear expectations. Let's hear what you have to say about that. Yeah. And it's interesting that you say uh, they come at it like 
from a reactive tactical operational perspective, give me that soon. You've got to, as a leader, think bigger than that, right? Like what's that vision first and foremost? As soon as you've got that vision, you're setting the direction and you're setting the objectives and therefore you can set results, right? But it all starts with that vision. You've got to have that. So you can then say, hey, here's what I expect. And you can start to like essentially a vision allows you to plan your work. But now you're working with the team, so you're actually flipping that on, flipping that and saying now you're working your plan, right? So you can say, okay, we've got these 10 projects. Let's spread them out over four quarters of the year and you assign people to Q1 projects. You can actually start to establish deliverables around that. Okay, this has to be delivered by here. This has to be delivered by Q2. This has to be delivered by Q3, right? So now you've established when. Then you can actually dig in a little further, especially as a leader, in terms of establishing thresholds for success. Okay, so, and this goes back to also product development, MVP, minimal viable product. Like what is that minimal viable success threshold? What would look, what would success look like if we were right on target? What would it look like if we went over target? That would be phenomenal. And what would it look like if you got to about 70%? Because they're all they're all success, right? Well, everything is an emergency. Everything is the most important thing. Yeah. So, yeah. So in starting with a vision, you start strategically, right? Then you can actually work with your team to plan that work, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've actually got the plan mapped out. They can work that plan. It's very clear in terms of deliverables, right? Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to flip this now and talk about behaviours, right? Because in most companies, we don't have a really well-defined culture. It's a little loose, loosey-goosey, right? They've got values. Most people know that companies have five values, but can they speak to them? Probably I, know it's on not, the wall, right? I know it's on the wall somewhere. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, yeah. We've got five values. I'm not sure what they are. Yeah. But as a team leader, you could extend that further and start to really yeah. deliberately create your own team's culture. You can take those five values and as a team break down the, those values into behaviours, right? Mm -hmm. So if communication is one of your values, what does that look like in terms of expected behaviour? Okay, an example would be, answer emails within 48 hours, keep meetings to 30 minutes, always, always have an agenda and send out notes. Ding, 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 ding. Be succinct. Uh, like if you start to define the behaviours, now you've set a threshold in terms of expected behaviour on a team. And guess what? You as a manager can coach to that. You can coach each other as a team to that and you can get feedback based on that, right? Um, so it's really important to actually also then clearly set behavioural expectations, mm -hmm. not just project deliverable, goal deliverable expectations. It's it, There's two things that you should focus on as a leader and it's the second one that most miss. Exactly. And then in I've created this um, program called uh, Writing Your Leadership Legacy. And in there, the leader has a conversation about this is what you can expect of me. And this is what I expect of you. And then it helps uh, if you have clear expectations, it helps as you go down the road, if you have an underperformer. Yeah. It's much clearer to say, this is what we talked about this was the date, you know, instead of saying some of my clients, all their projects have no deadlines. And so they're just kind of lost at sea and they kind of end up, they end up feeling undervalued or um, unwanted. Yeah. Because I guess what I'm doing is not that important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is why, again, it's so important to have that vision because when you're working on a vision as a team, 
you're uncovering what the purpose of the team is, right? Um, and so because you're doing it together collectively, there's buy-in and participation and it connects their work back to their purpose, which delivers on the vision. So it really is important to have that as a leader. Mm -hmm. I think why I was reminded of Gary Ridge is because your accent is very similar to his. He, oh. he, he is from Australia. There you go. <laughs> where, where, where is your accent from? From Australia, from is Sydney. It? Yeah, just okay. down at Monty Beach. Uh, so. And then, and then the um, the right at the end. The, the, it's it kind of if it were if we were going to write notes, it kind of goes right like that. Yeah, it's that anyway. question mark at the end. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it's a beautiful, that's why I was like, wow, she sounds exactly like Gary. Okay, number five, offer structure and guidance. Yeah, and that, that to me very much speaks of manager as coach, right? I think it warrants any manager learning some of the basic coaching skills like acknowledging and validating, uh, giving, giving feedback, mm -hmm. uh, being able to you know, oftentimes one of the big things that you deal with as a manager is the complete overwhelm that someone might be dealing with, right? And one of the things I often offer to those people is don't look at the big picture. Yes, be aware of it. That's where we're going to end up. But what is it that you can do today? What is that 1% where you can make a difference today? And bring them back into the present, right? Um so you really start to become that guide, that nurturer, that person that can help break things down for them so that they can refocus, right? And the structure goes back to also establishing things like meetings, regular meetings, uh, planning meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings, check-ins with them. They're human, right? Check in with how they're doing, especially during something like COVID. How are they doing? Because it's been really difficult for people. So check in with them. Um, and then with the expectations, you know, you've clearly established establish those. So push them along, check in with, are you blocked on anything? Is there anything that I can help uh, with? So it's it's about becoming a coach as a manager. Um, so those basics really will help create the structure and help you guide them through things. Exactly. Yeah. Number six, let go of the reins. You know, that I think is one of the most difficult things mm -hmm. to do because it's where's that right amount of control versus mm -hmm. go? Because on the one hand, you could be one of those managers where everyone thinks, <laughs> where are they? I never talk to them. They're completely hands-free, right? And then on the other hand, they're those micromanagers that everyone gets annoyed at um, because you're not empowered inside of that context. But it's finding that balance. And this is something that takes, I think, years to perfect. And I'll, I'll go back to this the assessing your team are they that low performer or high performer are they someone that's highly motivated with no skills or no uh, lots of skills but no no motivation understand where they fit in that skills wills kind of model and then use the right management approach with that person, right? So someone like a low performer is going to need more micromanagement. You want to keep them close. Uh, whereas someone like your high performer, you don't need to, to really do much there except give them that next initiative to go and figure out and blossom on their own. But it is very much around finding your feet. It takes years to perfect and then understand who your team is and the right approach for that team member. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm seeing um, effective managers keep their cards face up at all times. And... Um, I think that's a part of sharing your expectations. I'm going to let you know as much as I can, as soon as I can. Yeah. There's going to be there's going to be things I am not allowed to share right now. But I'm, as soon as I can, I'm going to let you know. And so, if you keep your cards face up, like you're saying here, 
um, it decreases because if people don't know, they make stuff up. Yeah. And then they, then it becomes gossip and then it becomes the truth. Yeah. I heard on July 1st, we're all getting fired. What? Where, where did this even come from? So I love how you took, cause I, cause when I'm dealing with someone on strategy or negotiation, I use the opposite. I'm like, okay, we're not going to put all our cards on the table right now. And that brings me back to, which I wanted to eventually get back to trust. Like I've had um, a C-suite person join this pretty well-known company. And I'm like, we don't even know who we can trust yet. Let's, you know, let's just wait and like, let's not put all our cards on the table right now. Let's just kind of get to know people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very much about transparency. I think transparency empowers people to make the right decisions because now they have context. Um, so share, share, share all the context you possibly can whenever you can. Yes, there are going to be some personnel issues that you will never be able to share until that time um, and you've got to align with that. But for the most part, for, for the day-to-day, -day, share, share context. Always. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Number seven, um, delegate work. My first time leaders have a really hard time delegating. Yeah, it is. Because because this is what they say. You know what? It's going to take less time for me to do it than to explain to someone how to do it. So then consequently they're working nights, weekends, they have no work life balance yeah. and the employees are sitting around going, do, 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 I got nothing to do because you're doing it all. Yeah. So let's see what you have to say about delegating work. You're disempowering your team completely, mm -hmm. utterly disempowering. Disempowering. Them, for right? sure. You're also setting up the company for business continuity risk because now you've got one person with all the knowledge mm -hmm. that actually becomes the funnel and you, have, you haven't you have built a team. Mm -hmm. You've built your own leadership stardom and you've created risk and disempowered the team. So it behooves you to, not only for your own work-life balance and your mental sanity, but it behooves you to actually focus on delegating out to the team because now you're upskilling the team, mm -hmm. you're empowering the team, you're challenging the team. Mm -hmm. And through that, you're actually building a high-performing team. So that's exactly. integral. And as a result of that, you're mitigating any of the risks that the company might face if you were to leave, right? Or, um, or, even, or even they'll say, do you want to take a vacation ever? Ever, right? <laughs> so someone's going to have to know how to do this. Yeah, it really is. And and through doing that, I tell you, you'll see when you yourself have someone on your team that's actually a potential leader. And you want to foster that. You want to foster them stretching their wings, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, here's another really good one, number eight. Let your people lead. Yeah. So... Have people step into a leadership position, right? Like what I often do is challenge my managers by having their managers in our leads meeting, right? And that can be really challenging for managers to face because suddenly now they were talking about that person's stuff. Now they've got to let go, right? So I'm constantly looking for ways to challenge my team. Mm -hmm. And so what I coach my team, my leaders on, is step back. Let that other person who's now reporting to you speak for that work. Let them speak up. Let them be visible. I want you to be quiet for a while. And then only fill in the gaps because that's going to stretch everyone on your team, right? Everyone. If you have them step up and start leading in whatever scenario it is, it's going to stretch them, especially those that might not be willing to step up, that might be fearful about stepping up or have stories about stepping up. Put them in the situation where they can start to build the courage muscle, start to build the presentation muscle, start to build the pushing back muscle. Uh, look for those opportunities 
where you can put your team into those opportunities because that's going to grow all of their muscles and start to round out the team. So have them lead. Have them lead, especially when people expect you to lead. Mm -hmm. Um, Make them visible because it's not all about you. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Was that just number? Oh, that's eight. Okay. Um, Anything else before we go on to nine? No, we can switch. Okay. Uh, Number nine, learn how to adapt. Um, yes. it's, it's crucial. Like it's crucial and dealing with, I don't know if this is the same for you, but dealing with ambiguity. Oh my God. Yeah. All the time. And all challenge. the time. All the time. So yeah. let's hear about learn how to adapt. Especially in tech, right? You've got mm-hmm. to, because in tech we innovate fast, right? Um, and projects start and then you drop them and then you start something else and or you have to reorg, right? Uh, you have to switch focus, switch gears. Don't get too attached to the way things are because that's where innovation starts to be stifled. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. So being nimble, being, being willing to change, Mm-hmm. And then being the leader behind that change mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. will start to create different ways of thinking, which then lead to innovation. Mm-hmm. So push for that change. Be that leader that is constantly pushing for change. Push your team to start thinking about, okay, how can we do this differently? What did we learn from this? Be willing to talk about those failures, your own failures, right? So that failure on the team becomes a good thing, not something that is hidden and not brought up, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be nimble, right? This is very much from Mm -hmm. the Agile methodologies. Uh, Be nimble because nowadays you have to change. The world is moving too fast. You'll Mm -hmm. miss opportunities left, right and centre if you can't change and change quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, When someone's stuck in their way and doesn't want to change and doesn't want to adapt, it becomes a blocker for every other team around them and they'll work around you. And in the end, what happens is you've created your own obsolescence, right? Exactly. In a short amount of time, it could be. Yeah, exactly. So it's critical that leaders are nimble and are willing to change and can change. In mm-hmm. fact, they should be more often than not leading that change and figuring out how to optimise their team, their workflows, those projects. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was looking at um, <clears throat> and kind of reading it when you said something about a methodology. What kind of methodology was that? Oh, sorry, from product development, Agile. Um, oh, Agile, Agile, I just didn't yeah. hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 my accent. Um, but, yeah, mm-hmm. it's just a, a product development methodology that is iterative rather than the old waterfall, which would take five years to develop anything. Agile works in a week or two week or a month sprint, and so you get something very quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we as leaders need to be. We need to be nimble. We need to produce results mm-hmm. quickly, uh, and we have to adapt to mm-hmm. kind of situations like COVID. <laughs> like COVID, and then it reminds me when you're saying that, um, I think a good leader takes risks, takes chances. So if you're having to do these things within a week, a two week, a month, there's going to be mistakes. It's not going to be perfect. But the leader says, let's let's move ahead. We don't need to check it again. We don't need to check anything again. Let's just put it out there and get some feedback. Yeah. Yeah. And then... Um, Look at this. We actually got through all 10. Uh, Give great feedback. Integral, right? So integral. Mm -hmm. Because all you can see for yourself and the work you do is a subjective view. And so feedback gives you that objective view, right? It gives you the impact of what you're doing on others, right? And it has you be a better employee. Uh, You grow from someone's constructive feedback and it's really integral, especially now you've set expectations, you've got a vision, you've got a culture for high performance. You've got to be able to give constructive feedback that will 
help upskill the team. It's really important to do. And it's important that that is the culture within the team. The team themselves give each other feedback because then the team will grow and they will become a high-performing team because now they can see, oh, so when I do this, that's the impact of that over there on someone else. So now you become conscious of it and you've got the opportunity to choose to change, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's some best practices with giving feedback. Mm -hmm. Firstly, ask if you can give feedback. Secondly, always write down your feedback beforehand. Take the personnel, the personal out of it. Just focus on the work. Don't attack exactly. the person. The person's another human being with feelings, so be conscious of that. Focus on the constructive, focus on work only. Set up a one-on-one, -on -one, do it with them face-to-face -face or virtually currently, um, and then ask for what their thoughts are, what was going on for them, and then set up some expectations in terms of next steps between you. And so that is following some good feedback practices. It's almost in a lot of ways, um, tip 11, start again. <laughs> yes. Like rinse, rinse, lather, and repeat. You know, just keep doing, <laughs> keep doing it. it. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I love it. For sure. We just have a few more things. I wanted to, when we were, um, before we went live, um, I just love the peacock. Um, logo that you're using mm -hmm. and then I read on your website um, a little bit about the peacock which I didn't know very much about it at all and then the one like I've never seen a peacock like that the one that you have as the main peacock so um, tell us a little bit about it, the significance and your choice of the peacock yeah so I guess the mission for the company is really to change or transform the corporate culture and world, right? We want to work on bringing authenticity back into leadership. And it really is going to take a transformation. And so why we chose the peacock is because it symbolises transformation. That bird does transform when those feathers are out and open. And for us, it was the symbolism behind that. And it's very much speaking to our own personal transformation and hopefully the transformation of the corporate world out there mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And how unique, like the one that's on your home page, um, I've never seen anything. Is that like a real peacock or, or it's color? Yeah. You colored it? No, no, no. That's real. That's amazing. Yeah, that's yeah it's beautiful, right? Oh, my gosh. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Unknown to me, uh, there are some ridiculous number of peacock types, something I like 30 or 50 variations in peacock. And there is a peacock farmer in Florida who is the US and world experts on peacocks. I was just reading about him the other day. I didn't know there were so many varieties, um, but yeah. That's so cool. There's so even white so ones. So cool. Well, look at that. An hour just flew by. It did. It just thank flew you. by. And thank you so much. And I just want to um, give people an opportunity. How would they get a hold of you? And any so, little, yeah. anything you want to say about yourself and your business and your partner. And we'll get Paula back on either separately or together. She can come on by herself or she can yeah. come on with you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so you can go to our website, which is www.transformativevisions.com. And there is a contact page there along with an about page, who Paula is and who I am. And yes, obviously, we do a lot of leadership coaching for companies and individuals. Uh, we focus very much on a couple of areas within leadership. So Management 101, uh, defining a culture, team performance. Uh, identifying a vision. So there's a number of things that we do. Um, but yeah, would welcome anyone uh, reaching out. And then you're on LinkedIn. Can someone contact yes. you on LinkedIn? Absolutely. Okay. So Sue Bolton at LinkedIn. Um, and we also have a company page for transformative visions. Um, I saw that, yeah. 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 So we regularly post blogs up there. So do join the company page. Awesome. 
Awesome. Any closing um, statements? Hope? Uh, it was a pleasure being here, Joan, and so great good. to see you again. Good. Good, 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 good. Yeah. We could have just gone on and on and on and on because I was, I've been writing down things and um, yeah, you talked about reacting and, and i always tell people to respond, not react. So we could go into a whole thing on that. We talked about trust. We didn't go into that too much. Oh, I mean, no. we could, we could go on and on and on, but, but thank you so much. I'm going to end the broadcast right now. And um, thank you everyone who's watching it either live or in um, recording. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye.